All right, uh, welcome. We're, we're few here in, in the building. There's a few more online, and there'll be others that'll be joining um, you know, by video later on. My name is Chip Oscarson. I'm the Associate Dean of Undergraduate Education and the Director of General Education, and I welcome you to our ongoing um, lecture workshop series uh, here in general education on inspiring teaching. Uh, that is, uh, we're looking for ways to help improve our teaching of general education courses. And we're really pleased to have with us today, uh, Larry Nelson um, from the School of Family Life. Uh, Larry Nelson is our uh, GE Professor of the Year uh, last year in uh, 2020. Uh, he has a really distinguished uh, both research uh, career, um, but what really, one of the things that really stood out to Larry um, when we were considering him for this award is his uh, teaching record here at BYU and the impact that he's had on students. Um, that you go through uh, the comments that, that students make about his, uh, his teaching, and uh, they're impressed not only with his ability to convey important and life-changing information uh, to them, uh, but they talk about the way that, uh, that he cares about them and that they, they feel this uh, caring. He's a great example of, uh, of really a master teacher, and we're thankful that he would uh, take time to, uh, to do this uh, for us today. Um, he's going to be talking about uh, emerging adulthood, and uh, especially about what, uh, what's going on in our students cognitively, emotionally, developmentally, uh, that we might keep in mind as we're planning our classes, as we're teaching our classes. Um, so we'll uh, go ahead and uh, turn the time over to Larry. Thanks for being here. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I had the opportunity to serve on the GE Redesign Committee. Um, thank you. Uh, as Chip can attest, I spent a good deal of my efforts, um, and as Susan can, energy on the committee trying to help uh, the committee see that we can't separate the academic education from the development of the whole person. I'll admit it was a frustratingly difficult task and one that I frequently feel I failed at, but uh, I hope to use the precious time uh, that I have today to try to help us see why understanding where students are developmentally um, informs uh, how we can develop the whole person, especially at the level of GE. So um, let's get a few terms uh, up. Please go ahead and do them both. Flourishing from the perspective of positive psychology uh, has been described as high levels of emotional, psychological, and social well being that lead to productive engagement with others and in society. Specifically, in terms of student thriving, uh, it, thriving includes academic engagement and performance, interpersonal relationships, and psychological well being. You'll notice that both of these definitions. Uh, that kind of drive uh, the field, those of us who look at these things, incorporate much more than just student success. Um, when looked at uh, specifically in school, most uh, faculty and administrators can readily see the need for academic engagement, uh, performance, and they can easily list the skills needed uh, for that to occur. However, however we often feel Sadly, in this university setting that all we need to do is focus on the academic and somehow that can be done uh, without addressing other aspects of our students' lives. Um, but they, they do not leave other aspects of their lives at home when they head to campus. It's all one thing for them. So I think this notion makes sense to you when we think about it at the level of, of smaller children and teenagers in school. You'd go ahead. We know that a child won't do well in school if they're hungry, if they're being bullied, if they're lonely, if they're experiencing problems at home. We get, get it at this level. But for some reason, I think think we fall in the trap of thinking, oh, they're 18 now, we can silo or compartmentalize their lives. Um, but we can't compartmentalize student well-being. Um, I don't know if you can really see that middle cartoon, but it says our silo mentality may be getting out of hand as they put up a castle and a moat with a crocodile or alligator swimming around it. Um, 
development doesn't work this way. It's not compartmentalized. Life isn't this way. So I think it's important to note also that when we take this type of compartmentalized approach on campus, we fail to recognize the absence of negative does not mean the presence of positive. And what do I mean here? We'll often, if you look at uh, what I've got on, on the right there, we talk about the whole student, but often in compartmentalized ways. Well, if they're struggling in this area, we'll send them to, and you can think of the department or the area of service, whether a counseling center, accessibilities office, on and on. We, we think that just by sending them to an area, we've now um, helped develop the whole person. Uh, but again, that compartmentalized approach often has us thinking about um, the presence, uh, sorry, yeah, the presence of negative. Well, if they're really struggling, then we'll deal with it. But we need an overall approach to teaching students, especially at the GE level, that will benefit the development of, or uh, sorry, uh, foster the development of positive for all students, so important. So with that introduction, let's look at the developmental context that uh, our students find themselves in and bring with them to each of our classes. Um, please, uh, very simply put, human development is the study of how people grow, change, and stay the same throughout their lives. Um, let's look at a few things that make up the developmental context for young adults or what I uh, call them emerging adults, please. First, they're developing in a period of time. I, I always have to, when I speak to parents, and so now when I teach to uh, my colleagues, I'm going to say the same thing. So many of us start conversations about how to help students with, well, when I was a student, <laughs> We got to stop that. We've got to stop that. There is nothing similar about the age uh, period in which they are now uh, developing. What has caused this? Uh, the biggest uh, thing that's caused to a difference in the developmental period of emerging adulthood is the delay of marriage. A delay of marriage, uh, we now, the average age of marriage is. It's really up to 32 when we look at all uh, industrialized nations. Average age 32 for men, uh, just under 30 for women, but specifically in the United States in 2016, it was 30 and 28. The next thing that's really impacted the change, oh, sorry, I've got this for you. I've been single for a while and I have to say it's going very well, like it's working out. Uh, I think I'm the one. Um, we're going to need some humor through all this. So um, go ahead, the next one. The other uh, big thing is the length of time before transitioning into adult roles has been postponed because of the education that's needed to now get careers. High school uh, diplomas just won't cut it. So there's an increased length of time needed to get uh, education that will provide um, a self-sustaining wage. Um, and that just takes time. So we are left with this long period of extended singleness that lasts all the way through the 20s when we look at the broader society on average. Well, that's the context that they've grown up in is how they should start to view then their 20s. And how do they view it? This was a study done by a colleague of mine at the University of Missouri in which he asked young people, what are the things you feel you need to do uh, uh, before it's too late? And late meaning before you settle down into those terrible adult roles. It's kind of how they view before you become an adult. Go ahead and just click through these. Um, their number one response was, hey, I need to use my 20s to travel, to party, to experiment, to engage in a lot of uh, romantic relationships, uh, to live a carefree lifestyle. I mean, they literally said things like, enjoy being lazy and not having a real job. Sports action, uh, finally, yeah, uh, get an education, independence and personal expression. If I were to give this a theme, 
based on what we just saw, it would be eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow you may. Mary. This is what they feel their 20s are about. This is what society has conveyed to them. That's the context for the development that's occurring. And if you think that our students are immune to this view that, listen, I need to put off adult roles, almost this view that I'll have to give something up. Oh. Once I marry, once I get a real job. If that's their view, and if we think that our students here at BYU are immune to that, we're wrong. Um, I could share with you some of my own research and others. I don't have time to go that much in depth, but I can tell you, I see it and hear it as I discuss marriage with students in my eternal family course. So that uh, we get to teach Religion 200 in the School of Family Life as F SFL 200. I hear it and it's best expressed maybe as an anecdote that I'd like to share. Um, I had a uh, female student uh, email me one day. She said, she wrote, Dr. Nelson, I need your help. I, um, uh, my roommates and I were having family home evening last night and the, the guys in our family home evening group, we were talking about marriage and they challenged us to name one way that they would be better off married than single right now, other than being able to have sex. And she was emailing me because she said, we couldn't give them an answer. So the men didn't think they would be any better off at this point in their lives, because this is the view that they've developed in of what the 20 should be about. So they had, did not believe they would be better off married and the women couldn't answer either. So this is the social context in which development is occurring. All right, let's continue then with kind of development, what this period uh, is used for, how it's seen. Um, these are uh, some features of emerging adulthood, what characterizes the development that's occurring. Go ahead, please. Um, there are five of them. Go ahead, we'll get them all up. Feeling in between, emerging adults do not see themselves as either adolescents or adults yet. They, uh, it's a time period in which they focus on uh, themselves. It's not necessarily being self-centered, narcissistic, even though that's prevalent at this time of the time, uh, uh, lifespan, but it simply means they lack obligations to others. This is the period in life in which they'll have the fewest obligations to anybody else, spouse, children, employer, and so they can really focus on their own uh, progress, growth, and development. It's a period of instability, um, evidenced by changes of direction in residential status, relationships, majors, work. We see more transition than any other point in the lifespan. It, uh, it's seen as an age of possibilities. Uh, young people really have the potential to steer their lives in any number of desired directions, and they perceive that. And it's a period for identity exploration. So let's start with the notion that they don't see themselves as adults. Go ahead, please. In a sample of, of non-LDS college students drawn from five universities across, uh, sorry, across the country, sorry, that's a sample, we found that 85% of young people do not consider themselves adults. They really do see this period of development as not yet adult. And that's why uh, it's referred to as emerging adulthood. Their parents don't see them as adults yet. And again, lest we think, well, it's gotta be different here, right? No, 76%. And I'd point this out, small print. This was, uh, I did in 2003. I can only imagine what it looks like now. Our students don't see themselves as adults yet. All right, let's keep going, please. Again, this overall view, run away from adulthood. Um, okay, go ahead. Let's talk about what's going on with the brain. Uh, brain plays a big role in development. And it was previously thought the brain development was done uh, by the end of adolescence. We now know that's not the case. It's usually not fully developed until about the mid-20s. 
Um, and as a result, here are some of the things that they still struggle with. Poor planning and uh, forward thinking, prognostication, struggle with impulse control, self-control. Okay, so they see everything in the immediate, not long-term. They have troubles delaying gratification. Um, go ahead. Powerful, uh, compelling experience of emotion, passion, and pleasure. They're very much about experiencing things, feeling things. And um, the lack of brain development leads to flawed or skewed processing of experience. Okay. So um, put in other words, they struggle with the ability to calculate risk, delay gratification, think rationally and beyond the moment, control emotions. They tend to be then distracted, overgeneralize, um, again, focus on the experience of the emotions. So um, some people, when I try to explain this, they say, but our students are so smart. Yes, that's not the same as cognitive capacities. If I had time, I could go into some child development. Do I have it? Um, experiments. There's a famous child development experiment with young children to show this in which uh, two glasses of water, identical glasses, same amount of water. And you ask a five-year-old, are they the same? Yep, they have the same amount of water. But if you pour that one of the glasses into a different sized glass, so maybe you have a tall, skinny, short, round, but you poured the water into it, they think the amount of water changed because of the shape of the container. And all day you could say, but look, if I pour it back in, it goes right back to the same spot and they're the same. So what happens if I pour that amount of water in this glass? They'll say it's different. And I have videos doing this with my daughter and my daughter at age five is reading at a sixth grade level. She scored in the 99th percentile on an intelligence test um, at that age. It has nothing to do with smart. It's what they can, their brain is capable of, of doing along these uh, behaviors that you see in front of you. We can't uh, equate intelligence with cognitive capacities or the lack thereof. So again, um, why is this important to understand? I'll be bringing all this to teaching. We've got to get one more big piece here, please. The developmental period now brings with it a lot of autonomy and lack of structure. With children and um, teenagers, as you think about it, there's hardly a moment of the day in which an adult does not know where a child is or what they're doing. Even if they're not with you, find my phone, all those things that we do, they tend to be in the care and keeping of adults, whether that's a teacher, a parent, a daycare provider, a coach, an employer. So their structure, and the reason structure is so important, important is it keeps children safe when they don't have yet the cognitive, linguistic, emotional, or social capacity to make decisions for themselves. But as they develop those capacities, we should lessen the structure, increase the autonomy. Here's the problem, that when we hit emerging adulthood, all that structure goes away. And we give them more autonomy, complete autonomy, on how to make choices of what to do, when to do it, and who to do it with. So that leads to a perfect storm, more autonomy, less structure, a brain that's not fully developed, the skills needed to offset the brain development not yet completed, and now they're legally responsible for their actions. Is it any surprise then that these are some of these things that we see emerging adult as the peak period for. Please, peak period for substance use. Keep going, driving while drunk, driving without a seatbelt. So all these risky behaviors, porn use, video game use, onset of mental illness, self-harm, disordered eating, just to name a few. It's also a time period because of this combination, which we see that the highest causes of death then are accidents and suicide. Nearly one in three Americans have been arrested by the age of 25. 
And I will tell you it's 40, I think, do I have this next? No, it's 40% of all men in this country have been arrested by the age of 23. College education rates are decreasing among men. 60 to 80% have at least one casual hookup. During this period, 45% of men report at least one hookup in the last year, and only 3% then uh, reach marriage without having had sex. And much of that, as you see above, is risky sexual behavior. Again, I, I know there may be, okay, these are uh, national numbers, but I need us to see this is reflective of this perfect storm that can be seen on our campus in some of those same ways, but in many others. Universities though, our classrooms though, have the unique opportunity to provide structure in a time in which there really isn't any other. If we feel our only responsibility is to teach students content to prepare them for a job and thereby not acknowledge the perfect storm of challenges they are facing, then we set them up to fail. Okay, let's get another one that's important for our students that we need to be thinking about as we're teaching them. This is a period for identity formation. I would argue it is the major task of the time period. It's to achieve this coherent sense of oneself, to answer the question, who am I? And so they do it in this very complex process that just takes time. First, they're going to explore an area. Let, let's use academics to begin with. So they'll explore in breadth. They'll take a variety of classes. They'll attend some various uh, information meetings about majors. They'll talk to people to just try to explore in depth. And then they'll make a small commitment. You know what? I think I'm going to take another class or two in computer science. And so they'll explore that, and then they just have to make a decision then. Yeah, this isn't quite right for me. So they reconsider it and they go back to exploring in depth, or they decide this is it, this is the one, and they commit to that um, commitment, to that major, and now they're all in to that. So it's, it's quite the process, and this is what we need to realize. Again, we may think, yep, that's exactly our role, on, on this campus and every entity on campus should be about that educational and career identity. But they're not going through this one only. They're trying to figure out their identity in regard to family, relationships, worldviews, religious beliefs, and on and on and on. They don't set that exploration aside when they come in classes. Many of them may be trying to figure out their uh, or sorry, academic identity, trying to figure out how that fits with their family identity in the future. They may be using the opportunity to pick a major to understand things that have happened in their past. They may be trying to figure out their system of beliefs but I don't know that I can take that major because that would push my identity in that area. They don't separate them. They don't separate uh, their need to figure out this developmental need, this, this, this internal drive to answer the question, who am I? They don't separate them. But we, we try to all too often. And indeed it would be academically arrogant to think that campus services or initiatives or activities or courses or majors are purely academic undertakings instead of resources used by students to discover a sense of who am I. All right, one more that's important, I think, for what we do. Go ahead, please. All right, that's just what I read. Young people see this time of their life with optimism and possibility of what they can do and uh, for the world and for themselves. I think any of us who have interacted with students sense this. They want to change the world. They want to change the world and they want to do it now. 
and any assignment or task or box to check that they don't see as connected to changing the world that they want to live in or becoming the person that they want to become, there will be a disconnect for them. And we often see them checking out of our classes at that point. And so mentally, if not literally withdrawing. So I understand that maybe uh, upper division math class, for example, may not provide the context that really integrate our subject matter with their efforts to shape the direction of their world. But I can't think of a single GE class that doesn't have the potential to make those connections. Um, so if we see our students and our material through their developmental lens, I think we can start making greater connections between what we're doing, our subject content, and their identity development, their uh, optimism, their going through a lot of instability and transition. In sum, uh, my emphasis on the need to educate the whole person isn't new. Uh, you've been having discussions of this for a long time. We all have. But I've attempted to provide this developmental lens of what is occurring during emerging adulthood brain development, identity development, lack of structure, the message they're getting about what the 20 should be about that might help frame why a focus on the whole person is so important. Indeed, when we take this developmental lens, we see that there is a need to teach skills to freshmen, especially early, that offset some of the limitations of brain development. Go ahead and please I've just listed some of the things here that they need to learn in order to combat. One more, please. Yep, there we go. Some of the things that they need to be taught. It doesn't just happen automatically, but developmentally, they need to know. So for example, in the physical setting, this is the first time really they've probably had the autonomy to manage their own sleeping, eating, shopping on a budget for food that will be healthy, if we're not helping them navigate that, they're gonna end up in our classes unable to engage because they're hungry, they're tired, they may not even show up because they slept through it. It's all connected to our uh, physical, excuse me, to our academic settings. If we're not helping uh, overcome the limitations of the brain and helping them you know, start thinking about others, perspective taking, broader visions, long-term uh, choices, we're going to have a tough time engaging them in uh, discussions of inclusion and equity, uh, uh, diversity, um, whatever the topic may be that we're trying to do early in their education. They need these abilities and trying to just focus on the academic piece without addressing these developmental needs is hindering what we hope to do in the classroom. So there's a need to teach those to uh, freshmen early on, please. So that means there need, this needs to be done across the GE curriculum. Repetition, repetition matters. It means uh, it needs to be there for all students and not just those struggling the most. Again, doing away with the uh, compartmentalization. Remember, the absence of negative does not mean the presence of positive. In our classrooms, we don't need somebody to do everything. Not each of us don't need to do everything, but each of us need to be doing something to facilitate the development um, of our students in ways that will help them connect to our material. So second, then there needs to be structure. Uh, many GE classes are so large that students can get lost. So we need to find ways to provide structure in these settings, such as accountability to a specific instructor, TA, peer mentor, or peer. And I want to get to some question and answer, but I want to give this example. For years, I've had a TA lab, and I thought that was sufficient. I just had large TA lab where students could come in and get help. I just thought, okay, I've done my part to provide a little structure in my classes of anywhere from three to 600 students. I've given them TAs. COVID hit, and I just felt a very huge obligation 
to provide even more structure. So I made one little change, two. Number one is instead of just having a lab where they could go in and see TAs whenever it worked with their schedule, I assigned students to a specific TA. So that TA, they, they knew who to go to. Uh, that, just that little bit of structure to that's who I go to, a name, a person. Number two, there was a structure for the TAs now accountable for a smaller number, and they can uh, keep track of how things are going. And the second thing I did is I started to send out weekly emails, structuring the week for them. And again, this may sound like they're older than this. They should be able to do this. Not when we look at their brain. That's an assumption that we as adults are making. Oh, when I was young, I, no, I bet we didn't. <laughs> um, but doing that and those two minor changes, I can't tell you the difference. And it actually made my life easier. If you want to know a side benefit. Now, all of those questions that are so easily found in the syllabus, I'm not responding to. They're going to their specific TA. So it has benefits for us as well. But even providing a little bit of structure, I can, the number of students who I'm dealing with at the end of the semester who, because their grades are low, they're, what can I do now? I, I can't tell you how it's diminished. A little bit of structure, huge outcome. So what if we somehow provide even a little more? Figuring out how to do that in our classes. It requires that we, uh, there needs to be more explicit connections between our content and the developmental tasks of their lives. Make our material resonate and connect with them. We should offer incentives to faculty, I believe, to be trained in some of the areas that might fit well with their curriculum. And institutionally, I think we need to break down these silos. In other words, we need greater dialogue between those making decisions about students those with expertise in specific aspects of the student experience, and those who study this period of development. I think if we can bring that together more like in this setting, thank you so much for doing this, we'll be in a place to where we can help develop the whole person and in doing so facilitate and foster academic success and well-being. All right, I think that was my last one. We need to truly want to meet students where they are developmentally in an effort to educate the whole. All right, I think we have some time for questions. Good question, if you don't mind, we have a mic. Um, we can pass it on to the people on Zoom who can hear the question. Larry, thank you so much. My, I guess my question is, since my youngest is 18 going on 19 right now and experiencing his first year living away from home, like how do, how do, we, how do we provide the structure and some guidance and instruction without, and, and still honor students' autonomy and agency? How do we do it in ways that doesn't sound like we're just preaching the same old thing they've heard? Or, or maybe it's better coming from us. I don't know, what, what would, how would you respond? Yeah, it's a really good question. So. Um, autonomy is so important in this age, and my work on parenting emerging adults underscores this. I, ca I can't say it enough, and I want to make sure everybody hears me correctly. As we encroach upon autonomy, the outcomes are problematic, whether that's via site control, so manipulatively, well, you know, after all I've done for you, your performance and your grades are showing you don't care. You know, that's manipulatively. Helicopter parenting, the definition that uh, uh, Dean Laura Walker and I and all of our work doing for our children what they developmentally can do for themselves, that's helicopter parenting. So that shift becomes now, instead of telling and guiding our kids what to do, we're sounding boards, we're consultants. Right? We're allowing them to bounce ideas off of us, and we're simply consultants. Have you thought about, have you considered, instead of, well, I think you ought to, you should do this. It's providing the structure developmentally. So, for example, it may be, and it's to the one, it's, it's every child's different. So, for one child, it may be, you know what, you should really ease into your freshman year by only working 10 or fewer hours. 
And then after a year, and so you've seen what it's like, you've got your high school study skills ramped up to college level, then you add more. It's, it's just in everything we do, try and provide that support by, you know what, by, if possible, if there are some resources we can do to help them developmentally ease into an academic setting, then when we do that, we're not doing it for them. We're not taking away responsibility. We're understanding where that child is developmentally and structure doing that's not taking any autonomy away whatsoever. And if a child says, no, I want to work 20 hours, all right, we let them. And then when they come to us in the third week needing to drop a class or two, then they learn by experience. But consultants, sounding boards, structure that doesn't infringe upon autonomy, absolutely possible. Not expecting it to be done with every child the same way. Is that the same thing for me as a professor? Like, how do I, I don't know, what does that look like? Yeah. So how well structured is the is our syllabus? Right? I've seen a range of syllabi of just lack of structure. Um, to our rubrics, our structure for them, right? Um, uh, having uh, my TAs do review sessions on how to write the paper. They still have to write the paper. And they still, if they're wise, they still should bring drafts to the writing lab and others. But I'm going to provide them some structure of what's there, assuming that, ah, they know how to write a paper. No, not the college level. So my rubrics for my uh, SFL 210 human development course is going to look much different than the rubric that I have for my SFL 490 capstone course. Um, so a lot of structure there, um, just in how we set up and organize a class. We're not doing it for them, but it provides some of that structure. Does that help? Does that, it's just an example. It's not an all-encompassing answer, but an example. Yeah. I, th I want to thank you for this overview, and I think we should... Uh... I want, I want to compliment you on your research and think we should bring this to a wider audience. Um, what, um, what is the impact of having been on a mission? You didn't talk about missions at all. And I'm wondering, it could, I, it could go the wrong way in that they come from a very structured environment to an unstructured. So I don't, I don't know. I just wanted if, if you could comment on if, yeah. if our particular students and the impact of a mission and returning from a mission. So... I'm going to talk in general. I, I try to show in my eternal family course when we discuss emerging adulthood, so being single, that this is why our culture is such a blessing because we provide structure, not just in missions, but in callings, right? We are accountable to be somewhere, do something, uh, accountability to relief society presidents, elders, quorum presidents, callings to do those things. These are these are forms of structure, accountability, responsibility that just don't exist. And so, but we're seeing young people not take advantage of them. They ward hop. And when you ask them, they'll tell social, meet new people and to avoid getting a calling. So now they're doing away with the very structure that the, uh, our religion is affording. The religion, uh, the, the mission is beautiful because number one, it allows uh, another 18 to 24 months of brain development to occur in a very structured setting. And it does help with some of these. Here's the problem. Once again, just as when they came from home to a mission, it is very structured. They're with somebody, they're accountable, their day is laid out for them, and they're focused on one. They're focused very much. They can see spiritual reasons for doing things. But then once again, we take all that structure away and have at it. So yeah, they develop some skills um, that hopefully they can make the connection between the same way that I organize my day in a timely manner. Oh, can translate. Boy, getting to bed at 1030 left me equipped to get up early. So maybe we just need to do a better job of helping translate that structure and the connections. Remember, you thought this was all about uh, companionship study, but how do you see it in that relationship that you're engaged in right now 
um, that is keeping you from doing your homework. And so you're great, you're just tying it all together. It's there, it's, it's provided the foundation, but I think we need to continue to connect the dots for them, how that same structure can be implemented in their lives and now in an academic setting and a, a romantic relationship and whatever it is. I don't think we translate the situation well. Yeah. In any class, but especially in large classes, you have uh, people that are, are not uniformly unevolved, if you will, or unformed. Yeah. How do you engage the different levels of uh, people in these things uh, and do fairness to kind of both ends of some sort of a curve? So two answers to that. Uh, one is I take the word of wisdom approach to the least of these amongst us. And that's in the structure not in the content. It's not in the content. These are smart, engaged. So, um, but some of my examples, and it's easy, I, I fully admit it. I, I teach human development, I teach the eternal, I'm teaching about these very things. But I still think it can be done to where our examples now is connecting their lives to content material via the examples, but. I still engage in the same critical thinking exercises. I mean, I, I share some, I think they are really try pushing students because there's a difference between the intelligence that they have and their ability to do that. But when I'm done, let's say with the critical thinking on exercise, I'll spend a few minutes on. So to be able to do that, what level of empathy did you have to have to take the side that I was pushing you on? How are you doing in that area? Um, how, were, how was uh, confirmation bias hindering? And so I'm still teaching the academic skills of critical thinking, but confirmation bias is actually one of the outcomes of where their brain is. Sadly, even though their brain may grow, they may not grow out of that if we don't teach them to recognize it. And so I, I just think it's, it's taking just a little more time when we're pushing them to think critically or introducing a, you know, higher level abstract concept, that's fine, we can do it. Just somehow in how we teach it, the example or in the debriefing of it, if I can use that term, just make a little connection, a little connection some way to their own life, their own development, how what we just did in whatever class it is could be utilized in their life. It doesn't take long, it doesn't have to be big, um, but the structure in the class I do aim at for the least, just like in the word of wisdom. Yes. I really appreciate what, the, what you were talking about, um, you know, several points of, of helping students make, make connections between these different areas of their life and, and potentially, uh, hopefully, what, what we're talking about in the classroom or whatever the subject matter might be. Um, and this, this idea that this, you know, taps into their, um, you know, inherent optimism in, in possibilities and that lie in front of them. Something that, that I've noticed, and, um, and I don't know how widespread this is, although I've, I've heard that it's more widespread than, than maybe I had appreciated, um, that students, um, whether it be because of our intensely polarized political environment or the, you know, the, the kind of bad news that you know, is kind of constantly um, you know, before them, that they're less optimistic about the future, right? So as, whereas, you know, perhaps a generation or two ago, there was the sense that my life is likely to be better than that of my parents, that, that that's maybe not a shared sense anymore with, with the coming generation. I'm wondering if you, if you have any thoughts on that. Is, is there, can we rely on this inherent sense of optimism or is this actually something that, um, yeah, that's a little bit contingent on, there's a little, it's going to be interesting to see how, what's going on in society is always the context in which development is occurring. So it's going to be interesting to see how that plays a role. But many, I always draw in the air my bell-shaped statistical you know, curve for students. On average, though, they feel they can change it. They feel they can be the ones to make a difference or they desire to. This is why 
I mean, when we look at uh, when we look at political activism, um, uh, movements in regard to uh, the environment, um, when it you know we we talk a lot about voting, but we we actually see this age group. They have the time to do it uh, a little bit more, so they they think they can change it and they want to be involved in it. And that's the whether the reality suggests that it can be done. That's different. Uh, but early on, they just believe they can do it. And so, if we take advantage of that, what are we doing in our classrooms? To and maybe it's not in our classrooms, but even pointing out resources. I, I think I forgot to put that on of internships and why it's important to go to a forum, even if you don't get extra credit, but us announcing it and to say why that would be important, just making those connections and getting them excited and involved. To, if we put in those terms, yeah, I want to make a difference. Oh, I'll go and listen. And again, kind of combining them back to the question that was asked, I just hope we'll think this, what I mean by connecting. I think all of us as professors maybe have thought about the analogy that through what we do in the classroom, we want our students to walk off the path that they're on and see the world from a different perspective. But too often what we do, and here's the to the least, some students can be left out <laughs> in the trees and think about, so why did, why did my professor leave me out here to look at these trees? I think good instructors, once we're off the path, and point out the world around them, we point them back to a path, to their own or whatnot, but now to take with them these new skills and abilities. Somehow, once again, connecting what we just did to where they're at. And too often, I think we leave them out in the trees. We do a good job of trying to walk them off the path and say, look at the world, learn something new, think through somebody else's eyes. That's in our head what we want them to do, but often we just walk them out there and leave them. And we don't make those connections explicit, our goals for them and pointing the way. So with this new knowledge, you can go back to where you were, you go this direction, that's development. That'll be helping them change and grow. And so just any little thing we can think about our pedagogy, um, making what's in our head explicit to them and what we're trying to accomplish and connecting it back to them, building off, that they are trying to figure out who they are, that they do want to make a difference. They do want to change the course trajectory of their own lives and those around them and on and on. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, uh, Larry, for, for being here and sharing us uh, with this. And thank you for, for being here too. Join with me in thanking Dr. Nelson. Thank you.